So Russell and I, uh, we met uh, like a year or two ago. Two years ago. Two years ago. My goodness. Okay. Two years ago. Uh, he's been using uh, the translator tech in the classroom uh, for quite a while, for that, for that entire period of time. Uh, and he's been using it to communicate with parents. Uh, Russell has been in education for 25 years. Uh, he uh, has been, a pr how long have you been principal at Chinook? For four years. Okay. I don't think it said that here, but I think you had told me and I'd forgotten that. Um, and before that, he was assistant principal at Bellevue High School, I believe. And then he was also in Franklin Pierce School District before that. Uh, he was a technology and math teacher, if I recall, uh, in Franklin Pierce District, teaching uh, uh, kind of uh, the tech side of things uh, uh, at that time. So he's always been kind of an early adoptee of technology. And so uh, we're witnessing some of uh, the efforts that he's spearheading, spearheading here. So the work that he's doing here is, uh, is uh, really kind of a wonderful use of this technology to communicate with students and with parents. I don't want to take away from his talk. I'll let him uh, talk about this. Since you just covered slide two for me, thank yeah. you. Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll go ahead and move forward. Uh, let's, whoops, let's get to the right slide. Ah. Okay. It should work now. Okay. <laughs> so thanks, Russell. So thank you, Will. Uh, so Will asked me to share a little bit about our journey with a tool to help us engage with students, engage more importantly at Chinook Middle School with families um, who speak many different languages. Uh, this is meant to basically be a case study. Okay, I'm here to tell a story, I tell a story of our journey, tell a story of our situation, the problems that we faced, uh, and some of the solutions that have helped us move along this, this journey. And in doing so, I'm going to give a little context, to just to start with our situation. So personal context, which Will shared a little bit just a moment ago. Uh, in, in my field of education, I am a bit of an anomaly. First of all, my background in training started off with um, a degree in business administration. Okay? I was not going into the world of education. I think I was going into finance was going to be was my initial aspirations there. And, and my road and my journey took a slight little detour. And so I ended up going from the, a corporate office to a classroom where I was a high school teacher, first starting off with history. Um, and then, but mostly in a uh, high school teacher of career in technical education for business, for computer technology, computer applications. Uh, it was something that I enjoyed. I liked trying new things. Um, back at that time, I had a Palm Pilot. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't. Okay, I had a Palm Pilot. And I had grading software on it, so I could actually walk around the classroom. I could grade. I could walk back to my classroom. I could hook a cord up to it, and I could push a button, and it would sync my grades up to it. I thought it was really, really cool. Um, so I was an early adopter of technology. And in my district, this was a small district south of Tacoma, um, I was often tasked with doing, with leading staff development for my colleagues around the use of technology tools in the classroom. And one of the things that I learned really early on was that technology that was fun met a lot of resistance because it was overwhelming for people trying to learn new things. But I learned that technology that didn't just serve a purpose but actually provided my audience, my colleagues, the opportunity to do something that they could not do without it. That was the sweet spot. That was when I got people's attention and that's when they were willing to try something new because they saw value uh, in the problem solving use of technology. So after teaching for a number of years at the high school level, I made the sh shift and the jump from the classroom teacher to being a building administrator, and I moved up here to the Bellevue School District. Uh, the last I mentioned my 14th year in the Bellevue School District. Um, first five years, I was assistant principal and principal of Interlake High School, just south of here. Uh, then spent five years over at Bellevue High School. In the last four years, I bounced down a little bit, but a new experience uh, being the principal of Chinook Middle School. So there's personal context, organizational context for our work. So the Bellevue School District um, is just west of here, east of Seattle. Uh, we serve approximately 22,000 students in grades K through 12. 
Now, we call ourselves a diverse district, and the concept of diversity means a lot of different things to a lot of organizations. If I am working in a school district over in Yakima, I'm going to have a lot of diversity. But the diversity, the way it plays out in some districts, is, is going to be a lot of maybe two primary different languages. For us, as you can see from the slides, when I pulled the numbers at the end of last school year, we served students from 124 different countries of origin. And our students spoke 100 different languages in the home. It's a little different picture of diversity than what school systems need to work with. 15% of our students are, are still learning the language. Uh, 36 of our students, a third of our students, speak a language for their first language other than English. And 14% of our families speak a language other than English. So let's talk about the purpose. So still within the, uh, the concept of context for this talk. So within our organization, um, and in the 14 years, our vision, our mission has been reworded a few times a little differently, but there's been some commonalities. And what you can see here in the most recent iteration is the phrase, to affirm and inspire each and every student to learn and thrive as creators of the future word, world. And what's been the constant for us is this concept of each and every student. Not some students, not most of the students, not the majority of the students, but each and every. And so when I think back to the demographics of our school system, that creates kind of some of the challenge for us. How do you work and deal with each and every student when you're dealing with this amount of different backgrounds and experiences of students? Our mission has some of the same concepts within it. To serve, once again, each and every student. Now for me, who's been in the district for a while, uh, the second part of this sentence is familiar. Working with students to serve them academically, and I'm used to that. How do I help them with their reading and writing skills? How do I push them at the secondary level to grow and try new things, and whether it's advanced placement programs or international baccalaureate diploma programs or working with computer science programs? I'm familiar with that. But what's new for us as our organization is changing are some of these other aspects that we're raising up in its importance. Serving them socially, emotionally. We're looking at more of a holistic approach to working with students. Through a rigorous and relevant education that's innovative and individualized. As a learning community that values one another's humanity which is a real unique concept for us to wrestle with and think through what does that mean in our actions. We're providing courageous support for an equitable and exceptional education for all students. Now, with our values, I'm not going to go through any of this, but what I highlighted in blue are some phrases that I thought were relevant to this conversation today. Values around interaction families, community. And again, for an old timer like myself, who's used to working with the student, teacher, student, teacher, student, sometimes the principal, okay? Now we're, we're, work, we're elevating up the families to say we want to be partners with you. Under service, we seek to understand our students, meet their needs and those of our families and community and to serve each other. Under respect, we're welcoming diverse ideas, diverse contributions, honoring strengths and traditions, and the collaboration. We're building inclusive teams of students and families and staff and partners. We're broadening the scope of our work. Now, let me go back on the right-hand side. You've seen we've got this little hexagon honeycomb, and these are our strategic priorities as an organization. Many of these are very traditional for us, high-quality instruction, student well-being, culture, and climate. But in the bottom right is this newer one for us. It's the red hexagon family and community priority. And so what does this mean for me as a building leader? Because it's my job to take these ideas and translate them into action for my unique community. And again, I kind of highlighted in blue some, some concepts within here. Cultivating partnerships. Engaged parents. Now, my, my little side note. 
in my world, this, the word engagement is a loaded term. It's part of our teacher criteria where we're evaluating. I'm actually going to tease it out a little bit later on. But we think a lot about what does it mean to actually be engaged in something? And how is that different than being compliant? If I'm a student who comes and shows up, I may be in attendance every day. I'm there on time. I don't disrupt the class. I do every single assignment. I may get a good grade in the class. But am I really engaged versus somebody who is thoughtful, who's asking questions, who's internalizing the ideas, who's making a broader contribution to the, the, the community within the classroom? So for myself, when I see that word engage, this is what I begin to think about. I'm not just talking about parents who come to listen to me talk, but how do, are they fully engaged in the schoolhouse and in the conversation and with each other in the process? Empowered to contribute. Uh, deeper understanding of perspectives and needs and two-way communication. So these are all the things and the ideas and the concepts that are running through my mind as I think through my role in building partnerships with my parents and my families and my community. Organizational context. So now let's get personal, local, and immediate. And let's talk about Chinook Middle School. My world. Chinook, uh, we are a... Decent sized school. Okay, we're just under a thousand students, grades six through eight. We are what's called a community neighborhood school. No special programs, no magnet programs. If you live in our attendance area, we serve you. Okay, come on in. Um, you're part of our family. You can see our demographics 45% um, white, 55% non white. And what's ironic is we are actually. So is 950 considered small? That seems pretty big for a middle school. For a high school, I can see. We have I? five comprehensive middle schools in our district, and we have two of them that are larger than us uh, okay. and two of them that are smaller than us. Okay. But, I mean, a countrywide, would 950 students in a middle school be considered fairly large? I would say I've seen middle schools that are 1,500 to 2,000. Oh. Okay. So wow. there are very large middle schools in some areas. I think in this, geographically, in the Puget Sound area, this is on a larger school compared to some other middle schools. Okay. Okay? Um, so when I say that we're 45% white, 55% not, we're actually, and ironically, the least diverse middle school in our district. So the other four middle schools are even more so. But this has been, for us, been shifting rapidly for our part of the district, even in the last two years. 10% of our students are, are English language learners, and in my little small portion of the community that I serve, we have 32 different home languages. The photograph down below is a picture from our commons. Our, one of our traditions is that we hang a flag of origin for uh, that represents the, the country of origin for each of our students who attend our school. Our little United Nations within the school. <laughs> so here's the challenge. The challenge is not only how do you communicate with students who are learning the language, but how do you communicate with the families? And perhaps the guiding question at an even more conceptual level is, how does language either include or exclude families from the community? Now, I have historically used a variety of different tools to help my families understand what's going on. We have translation of documents. Um, I don't do this with everything, but we have some of our major documents that the district will provide translations for. Typically, this will be provided in one or two different languages. If they're translated, we typically will get it in Spanish, and we sometimes will get it in uh, Chinese, and a little less frequently Korean, as a couple of our primary languages. We really do not provide options in other different languages. If I take something out of a document and post it on our website, then I have the ability for families to just change it into their own language, and so that provides some accessibility within it. 
but not everything goes there, and there's not exactly a back and forth option in that environment. We do use human translators, and these work really well when there's a contained meeting around a specific family need. An example would be a meeting around a student, perhaps special education or needs where the team wants to come together and we're pulling teachers, we're pulling in the family, and if that parent speaks another language, then we can bring in a translator for that specific language. But it's a very controlled environment that's very narrow in purpose. And when we cannot bring a human translator in, we have the ability to tap into a language line that we can dial in and get, get a translator. Again, the context and the environment tends to replicate what we would use for a human translator. Now, of course, I like to go above and beyond those just a little bit. So I'll pat myself on the back. All sarcasm is intended. And we at our school um, have a parent meeting, typically quarterly, called a multilingual parent coffee. And so this is a time that I can have a dedicated conversation for family members who do not speak English. And I can structure some supports around that. Down below is a photograph from one of these um, copies from about two years ago, I think this was. We have a um, team of language ambassadors within the school that serve four primary languages, Spanish and Chinese and Korean and Japanese. And so we will set up in four little large table groups and the translators are present and either I can give a talk, I can have somebody else come in to be a presenter and then we can take that topic and break it up into small chunks. The tran you said translators sit at each of the tables. Are these paid translators then? These are volunteer these? translators. So volunteer. these are parents. So again, these are kind of ambassadors. So I have a team that are willing to, to serve in this role. And so if I was giving this talk about every couple of sentences, supposed to be every couple of sentences, but for me, sometimes it's every five minutes. So they tell me to stop. <laughs> and they'll say, we need to translate this. They'll try to remember everything that I've said. And they will have their little conversations amongst the tables simultaneously. Yeah. And uh, then sometimes they'll ask clarifying questions. And then we have a back and forth uh, between the, very, the four different table groups. Some examples. And so I, I pull our, our topics from this last year. One of the first ones that I typically will... Uh, sorry, there was just one with the different table groups. What happens in that scenario? Because you have the four different. Well, I'm going to come back to. I oh, think you're coming question. back to that. Okay. I've anticipated yeah, I was your like, question. Wait, okay, never mind. Yeah, oh yes. <laughs> so um, here's some examples of some of our topics. I start off with uh, an overview of what middle school is like. Now, this is a talk that I give every year before school starts to our new families coming in, our sixth grade students, and transfer families who are coming in the seventh and eighth grade. Because every school is different. A secondary school is very different than an elementary school. I'm moving from one teacher to seven teachers and I've got different, new grade books are different and the whole system and the structure is different. And so then I talk through what the day is like and how you navigate the system and how, it's, how you can follow your students' grades and how we communicate and what the day is like because we have our regular seven periods, um, but we have a different schedule on Wednesdays, but we'll forget about that because after seventh period, then we have a tutorial period and then we have activity periods and we have buses after this time, but not after this time. It gets really confusing for families to try to figure out how this works. And so I take the time to talk through what that looks like. So I do this with all of our families before school starts, um, but I'm in an audience, I have an audience of about 300 families, and so that's not a good avenue to pause and have translations in large groups. So then with this group of families, then I do this four weeks later, which is three weeks after school begins. Timing isn't the best, but it's what we've been doing. We talk about all the various assessments that their students will take. 
because every state, every school system has different types of assessments and they serve different purposes uh, for their students and parents are always really, really concerned with how their students are doing and, and get worried if the number is wrong on one of those things. And so then I try to tell them, Pay attention to this one. Don't pay attention to this one. I'm not even going to show you the score on this one because it's irrelevant for you. It only helps us. Um, and parents will say, but I want to see it. No, you cannot see it. Uh, so we talk through all of that. We spend some time talking about um, choosing courses for the next school year because that's a it is, it's really important and parents want to know, I'm a sixth grader, what should I choose for math or science? What's the vertical progression? What does my student need to get out of high school and into the best college because it's really important to make sure I make good choices now going from sixth grade into seventh grade because if they choose the wrong course, they might not have the best transcript they could have when they're in high school and they may not get into the, the college of their choice and their dreams. A couple of you are nodding about this. This sounds familiar. Um, so there's lots and lots of questions about, uh, about because we have high school credited courses in the middle school and when should you do this and when shouldn't you do this and math acceleration and so forth. So there's lots and lots of questions uh, and misunderstandings about that whole process. And then we also took some time to introduce high school because that's also a big concern for some of our families and they want to know what, is, what that transition is going to look like going from middle school to high school. So this is what we did last year in the context of our multilingual uh, parent coffees. And so with our, our four different translators um, and taking the time to go through this, and there are lots of advantages to this model, okay? We do get to provide those human translators who can provide some nuance for the language, so that is important to be able to convey. We do get a chance to have some back and forth. We do have a chance to have some questions. In general, I feel good about this. I'm meeting the needs of, of some people. But the more I thought about it, in lines with our priority, the more I became um, unsatisfied with that model because I recognized that there were some gaps and we were missing some things. What happens when you have somebody who speaks a different language other than those four? I remember very vividly a situation that happened, oh, maybe about a year and a half ago where um, it was a time that I was not the presenter. So I was sitting at the back and a woman came in and I'd never seen her before and I could tell that she was looking around trying to understand what to do and where to go. So I went over to her. She spoke a little bit of English but not much and I understood that she was looking for the Russian table. I didn't have a translator for Russian. So... She looked a little bit disappointed, and the solution for her was to join the Spanish table because there was space there. Uh, you're chuckling because I'm assuming that you're recognizing that this accomplished exactly what we all can anticipate it accomplished. Absolutely nothing. She sat there. I watched her the whole time. Um, she did not have a pleased expression on her face. She did not understand what was going on. She did not interact with another human being. She left early. She never came back. I had an opportunity to engage with one of my parents, and I blew it. And I lost that opportunity. And that story stuck with me ever since then. Um, another challenge, some of these tables are quite large. So if I have a group where the table is about the size of this little square here, all sitting around the outside, it is really hard to be close enough to that human translator to hear what is going on. And I sometimes will have parents who will be sitting behind, off to the side, on the peripherals, and then I could tell that they're really not engaged because they are not getting their needs met even though I do have a translator for them. And the other aspect is this, this sense of um, culture. And let's go back to this idea that I will sometimes share something to one 
large group of my school community, and then three or four weeks later, I share it with those who don't speak English. Am I creating this sense of other within the school community? Am I saying that we don't have one Chinook parent community, but I actually have multiple ones? And I, I actually didn't address this one, so I'll bounce back up to that second bullet point up there, which is that I do get lots of interactions between a single language, but I really don't get interactions between families who speak different languages. And it becomes all uh, a very traditional classroom environment where it's you know, student to teacher, back to another student, but I'm not getting student to student talk. In this situation, I'm not getting family to family or parent to parent talk amongst themselves. So if I come back to these priorities, now I added some orange highlights. This, my tools and my structures have been really good and very sufficient potentially with some limitations um, at providing information, but I'm not as good at creating partnerships. I'm not really as good as, as getting uh, engagement and dialogue as I could. And so this is two years ago. Uh, Eric Ferguson, is, uh, at the time his title was the, Bellevue School, this was the Director of Technology, uh, Instructional Technology for the Bellevue School District. And you know, this is his concept. You know, imagine being able to engage in a real-time conversation with people who speak many different languages. And so he talked to me about this, and I thought, well, that's a pretty profound concept. What if rather than having multiple different conversations, if I could have a single conversation, if I could have a single community, if I can engage with everybody simultaneously? And so that's where for us, this was our access point to the use of Microsoft Translator. Rather than starting in the classroom, I started with families because that was where the real need was at the time. I wanted to engage in with the parents. That was really important for me. And so... Um, similar to what you're able to do in this conversation today, what this tool enables us to do and what me to do is to have a singular conversation or presentation and have parents, family members, community members, students, staff if they need to, join in the conversation so that they can participate in it real time, in the moment, in their language, and have the ability to follow along whether or not I have a human translator for them, whether or not they're sitting on their peripheral because they came in a little bit late, there wasn't any room at the table. Everybody is valued equally. So that was our work initially. And it, was, it stayed within, I'll say, that smaller group of that multilingual parent copy because what it did is it enabled us to refine the service of families in that moment in that group. Well, now it's time to actually actually push this out into a kind of for us, I'll say Microsoft Translator 2.0 for our work at Chinook, okay? our next iteration of this. As I think through new ways that I can use tools and technology to serve uh, my community. And so one way that we're going to do this, and I gulp just a little bit because I know that this is a little um, audacious, but we're going to give this a try. So rather than having two separate conversations and refining it within the small conversation, what, can I do, what would it look like if I were actually to have a singular conversation, a true, large group, singular conversation? So that new parent orientation that I do every August, this year I'm going to be doing it with this tool. So I could have that same conversation with every family because every parent's going to be coming in. The sixth graders are going to be dropped off so that they can have their orientation experience in, in the uh, gym uh, with their upperclassmen mentors. And I can say to all the families, now join us. And I think that this is really important because then I can message the, this value to my community. And I can say to all the parents, the parents who speak English, we are Chinook. This is who we are. And this is important to us. And it's important enough that we're actually going to take steps to put this into action so that, you can, so that everybody can feel that we're part of a larger community. And so with a group of about 350 whatever students, uh, parent members, that we'll be able to do that. We'll do the same thing when we have some of our other large group um, um, sessions this fall. Curriculum night with about 600 to 700 family members all at once. Um, 
with our sixth grade camp orientation. Again, I want to make sure that at any point in time when we do something as a school, we are providing immediate access for every single family member. And so that they have the ability to, in that moment, ask a question, get clarification, make sure that they understand it. I'm not actually talking along the slides. I got out of order. We'll continue that. That's what this one was. <laughs> okay. Um, we, the other thing that I'm curious about, and I know that there are some other uh, systems that have started, have flipped this around, have started with the classroom. Okay. And so for myself, what I want to do is model this, and I'll be training my staff on this when we have our staff training in August, is I also want to be conscious of the student need, the student need in the classroom. Being a school that does serve students who do not speak English and have limited to no ling uh, English language proficiency, they're in all of our classes. They're in a science class, they're in a social studies class, and as a principal, I'm often in and out of classrooms, and what I often will see are students who look like this. They're being very compliant because they know what they're supposed to behave like in the classroom. But they really don't know, they don't have the language to know how to engage with the person sitting next to them. And they don't have the language to potentially understand what the teacher is saying. And if I have two or three or five or 10 different languages within the classroom, um, that becomes the challenge, right? And so that if we can look for those moments of time when the purpose and the learning purpose is not English language learning because that has a function in and of itself. But there's also times when I need to understand and learn content and apply skills. And it's a challenge to do that while I am simultaneously learning a language. So if we can tease out the purposes and the separate purposes and become more sophisticated in applying the technology strategically to when it serves the most valuable, um, for the student, then we can make sure that we are meeting the educational academic needs of each and every student. Also, teachers will also have time where they will be sharing with their families and they can do something similar with their smaller communities than what we will do as a whole school. Um, I pulled um, a few excerpts from uh, the instructional expectations of our staff. Okay, every teacher has um, contractually, they're evaluated, there's performance expectations, a bunch of different criteria for our teachers. And here's a few of them that actually are relevant to this. Okay? So engaging students in learning is one of the criteria. And if I'm a teacher, if I'm expecting to be proficient in this skill, I should be making sure that all students are intellectually engaged in challenging content. Not just the students who speak the language of the teacher. Not just most of the students, okay? Um, evidence of st student initiation of inquiry. It's hard to initiate inquiry if I really don't understand what's going on. Students have choice in how they complete tasks, may serve as resources to each other. Man, we've got a lot of great resources amongst our students. And if we're pulling in students from 124 different countries with 124 different cultures and expectations and experiences, that's a lot that we can pull into a classroom setting if we're talking about developing creatives of their future world. But we need to make sure that we can provide, have the tools that provide the opportunity for the students to um, serve that function. Culture of learning. Uh, initiating improvements and making uh, revisions in detail and helping peers, right? Questions and discussions, okay? All of these, and these are just three out of about 24 different criteria where the language of the student really is important in order for the teacher to perform his or her function within the classroom. And of course, lastly, um, there are those, those impromptu one-on-one -on -one conversations, and I think this tool has those, that flexibility for it. 
I have a registrar um, whose function it is to meet with families when they first walk into the school who are wanting to enroll and register and make sure everything's taken care of. She, I'm fortunate that she speaks Spanish. So she speaks two languages. And I have a whole lot of other languages walking through the door. At times it's helpful to have a translator, but at times parents come in for just a quick question. And saying, wait till we can organize, you know, a formal translator to come in is not meeting their needs in the here and the now. And so if she has the tools to conversationally just pull up and just say, let me just have a brief interaction so I can meet your needs and allow you to go about your day because you're important and your time is important. And we want to serve you right here and right now the quickest possible way. That her, her ability to do so is really important for us. And so those, as we look into the school year, those are some of the, the ways that we're looking to take this tool, build off of our initial successes and experiments with it, and to um, hopefully meet a greater set of needs for our whole families. And so I guess at this point I am finished, and if there are any questions. Uh, if you have some questions, I'd prefer if you use the microphone, because then it won't go on the caption stream for Sweta, who is relying on these captions. And for anyone else in the audience, I turn it on. Hi, Russell. Um, oh, uh, hold on. Thank you, Russell. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. um, thank you very much for coming here. Uh, I'm curious to hear about what are your top feature requests for translator, and then top complaints about things that you wish worked differently? I will say the, um, and I'm, I'm going to speak to somebody who has, um, I do not profess to be an expert in the tool. So Will may take a look at my answer and just say, oh yeah, I can do that. <laughs> so I'll say, great, show me how to do that, right? So, so for us, the ability to, um, so we've talked about the importance of, of being able to hear things simultaneously. Um, and I know, I think being able to capture the conversation to preserve it, for having each person to be able to do that in his or her own language. Is that something that I know I can save it in mine. Can each person save their own transcript? Um, so today that depends on how you are using. So it depends by platform. Okay. So if you're using the web app, um, you, if you, uh, you can save it. But if you're using the Android or iOS apps, you can't. Okay. So that's, that's one of the inconsistencies that we would like to. So I would, say, I would say based upon that, because a lot of our families are going to be using um, the iOS or the Android app in order to join the conversation, I think that's going to be really critical for them. Um, because they're going to be able to follow along um, partially, but for them to be able to, um, to come back to it, because they may realize... I think he said or she said something. Let me revisit that at a later point to make sure I understand it. Um, I often will have family members who will come in who will join the conversation late and will wonder, well, what happened prior to my joining of the conversation? And if we have the ability to archive, if, if the whole session, and if I join in um, Mandarin halfway through, can I get the full transcript of that session in my language rather than just from that point forward, right? So, I, I, so I'm thinking in terms of fully meeting people's needs. Um, and of course, I think that the feedback from families has generally been that this is, um, the accuracy of the translation is, is always important. You do want to make sure that it is, number one, capturing my words, so the voice to text uh, in the primary language is important. Secondly, it is that translation from um, the text into the other language is also important. And I, I think most of the feedback that I've heard from families in the field is it's generally pretty good. It's sufficient enough for them to understand. They always recognize that there are some nuances that it didn't capture correctly or accurately. Um, but it's further along than if they didn't have it. If you uh, dream a little bit further, 
uh, what uh, assuming uh, we address the, feed, the, the the things that you yeah. uh, that you just mentioned if you dream a little bit further uh, how, uh, how 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 could we uh, how could we uh, make it even more suitable you mentioned for instance that you have not yet merged the multilingual session with the with the general with the, the yes with the monolingual session right uh, what would be necessary in order uh, for uh, to to allow you to do that uh, or any other more future looking things that uh, that make your uh, your community a more integrated community if 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 i were to dream my 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 future of communication was that this this would take place with the least amount of reliance on on devices as possible because that's an unnatural conversation right if i want to talk to somebody to be staring down at my phone the whole time is not a natural interaction with a human right um, but you have a headpiece in your ear what song are you listening to? <laughs> <laughs> My hope was that I would hear this in Italian. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I think that's that's the, so I think the 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 vision <laughs> is that the more that this technology, uh, and, and I live in the world of, of middle school kids, and I live in the world of middle school students where a hundred percent of them have a device in their ear at some point during the day. Right, so walking down the halls or interact, talking with their best friends with something in one of their ears is really normal, right? Uh, I think of iPods, assuming not iPods, the, um, the the earbuds, right? Am I using the right term? I don't have them. I think my daughter does. <laughs> I'm starting to feel a little older because I'm starting to <laughs> search for this exact name of, of <laughs> what came out this last year, right? But you know, wire, wireless basically wireless headsets, right? And so the more that conversations can happen where I'm talking face to face with somebody and I might be hearing the translation in my ear. So I'm thinking in terms of socials, I'm uh, impromptu informal interactions. If I'm talking about building a community of whether it's students who are sitting in the gym and I mix them up into groups of eight or 10 different um, uh, different small groups, they're not going to want to have create a session to have their devices or their laptops in front of them, right? So I think the more that we can untether, I think if I were to dream uh, in a multilingual community, I think that would be advantageous for us, right? And then, um, then potentially some of the barriers for my staff, and so I, I'm thinking in terms of that standpoint because we have technology fatigue. And, and initiative fatigue of people who are really nervous about trying new things. It's taken me a couple of years to get some people ready to do OneNote. And I burned a lot of political capital in, in getting people ready for it because it was so different than what they've done before, right? And so uh, the more that this could just be embedded into what it is that they naturally do as human beings, teaching, conversing with others, and I think the more that will be, uh, then I think the adoption cycle will be much quicker for them. So uh, I just want to mention that, I mean, David's dream of listening, I, that can be done now. Yes. The, this comes back to a conversation that Frank and I had earlier, is that it's not simultaneous now. So if well, you're- Well, this is simultaneous, but I've also had to formally create a session yeah. Right? Well, so I no, guess I wonder right. if you ask me what I were to dream, oh. how would this happen if I've not created necessarily? Oh. Again, you asked me to dream, <laughs> okay? And if I made a dream, like if we could somehow find a way where the setup of the conversation is a little less formal and easier for people to do, right? Where it could happen much more naturally. I'm walking down the street and I see somebody. So, for example, I remember you, you, you mentioned Italian. So when I was in college, and I, I spent a month in Italy, I took some classes, I took some rest in art classes, and I remember we took a little, myself and a few friends, we took a little side trip to, um, to Venice. It wasn't on our official stop. We had like a free day. We got to see uh, Venice and Pompeii and so forth, some cities on the southern part of the, the city. And so we were getting ready to take the train back up to Florence, and the trains were about ready to go on strike. Not unusual, evidently. <laughs> and, um, and 
so everything was packed, right? We just got jammed in there. I was separated from my friends, and I looked around, and I'm surrounded by a bunch of, um, it turned out, it was a bunch of young Italian men who are getting ready to join. They have conscription into the army, right? And so they're getting ready for that. And I'm looking around, and I'm the only non-Italian. And I saw one of them figure it out really quickly that I was not Italian, surrounded by them on the train. I was really nervous. Um, <laughs> that being said, I spent the next hour having this wonderful, fascinating conversation. We tried. We did the best we could. We kind of sat on the floor, and we were drawing pictures with our fingers of trying to have an impromptu conversation of just trying to understand where each other were coming from. He figured I was from Seattle. I think he had a, uh, I don't know how I got him to understand I was from Seattle, but anyway, <laughs> he had some distant relatives who were kind of from the area, and that kind of excited him just a little bit. So, I, so you know, my dream would be, I didn't set up a formal, how do I have a natural conversation with somebody on the street? Other questions? I've got one second. Okay. Uh, I don't think it's on. Uh, I didn't turn it off. Hello. Okay. Hello. Right, so, one question. Um, what advice would you have for districts that are interested in moving forward with this, right? Perhaps they just have a, some awareness about this and they want to move forward. Maybe they started using a little bit, you know, they, they see how great it could be, but. I would say um, start, I would say start off with a safe audience. Right? If I'm building capacity, I want to start off in a safe place. Right? I want to build some wins. Number one, I want to get confidence myself within the technology. Um, I want the initial ones to be relatively successful in a moderately controlled environment where I can safely tease it out and try it out and learn and grow with it. Because I found that, that I have learned how to use it better as I've used it more. I use different um, voice-to-text translation software in my work. I use Dragon Naturally Speaking because I do lots of narrative, and so I'm going to do a lot. I talk at my computer a lot, and people get, look really strange because I'm in my office. They look at me through the window, and I'm just talking into blank space by myself, <laughs> right? But that's what I'm doing, right? So I'm used to that, but I know that each piece of software has some subtle nuances uh, in how I speak in order to capture it accurately. Uh, so for myself, um, this... Avenue worked well because it was something that I already had in place. I was doing it with people that I had trust with. Um, these were family members that knew that I cared about them in meeting their needs. I demonstrated it, and I could say, I want to try this because I think I can do a better job of meeting your needs and, and other people's needs. So help me try this out and give me some feedback. So I think for myself, that was a great first place, rather than jumping into my staff, who might be looking for every possible way for this to fail, because if it fails, then I don't need to learn how to do it. <laughs> right? So let me build some wins and, and incubate it in that environment. So I think for myself, with technology adoption, with an organization, I would probably approach it that standpoint, um, because now when I go to my staff in August, I have something that I have confidence in. I played it out in some environments. I could, if I wanted to, bring in some parents in who could speak to how this works from a user standpoint. Um, and then I could look for some early adopters to say, all right, now let's look for some individuals who want to try this out and then have them branch outward. Uh, what uh, could have, uh, should have we as uh, Microsoft people done in order to uh, make it easier for you to adopt or uh, be uh, aware of that this stuff exists and what can and should we do to help others after you to, uh, to make that easy? So first of all, I will, I will give a plug, um, which I think is a, a huge asset in a tool is um, the instructional letters to families that are pre-translated into different languages. 
it's one thing for me to have a tool. It's another thing for me to explain to somebody who doesn't speak English how do you actually access it, right? So I do think having tools like that is hugely beneficial because now I can just send these out to my families and just you know just say you're going to you're going to receive an invitation to this parent orientation or the curriculum at night or something like that. When you come, here's what you can do to help access it, and they can understand that. So now I can actually kind of front load it. So I think that's helpful. I'm also going to supplement that with my team of, of uh, multilingual ambassadors. I'm going to have a station set up so that they can actually provide assistance for somebody um, who's coming in. All right, I downloaded it. Now what do I do? Right. Um, I will say, um, but your next question I think is interesting. How, if I'm a school system and there's lots and lots of school systems or organizations or churches or a whole bunch of different um, places where the need to work with multilingual families is very much of a presence. So the question is, is how do people know about that? Okay. Um, I know about it because I happen to have somebody in my organization who had heard about it and said, came to me and just said, hey, let's try this. Right? I stumbled upon it because of somebody else making a recognition for me to try it. And guess what? When I talk to the other middle school principals or the other principals within my organization, they don't know about it. Okay? Um, because I've not, and I will be, basically serving as, you know, as I volunteered to basically reach out and just say, here's something that I think actually might help you out there. So I do think um, the whole awareness aspect I think is important for organizations to think through, like here is a tool uh, to utilize. Um, I think embedding it into, which I, th I think the, the work to embed it directly into PowerPoint rather than having, I mean, back when I started, I had to get into the Microsoft garage um, and download, <laughs> uh, you know, this add-in to make it work. Um, so I do think the more that it is just built into the existing software and tools and that it can be one of those features that's in there, now I can just say, well, what is this, right? Because there's a lot of accessibility tools. But even then, so like, for example, we use, uh, instructionally, we use um, OneNote class notebooks that have a lot of accessibility tools built into it. And guess what? A lot of my teachers don't click on those to figure out that those are actually there. Um, so unless I actually take the time to say, here, click at this button and see what this does, and then they go, oh, that's really cool. Um, but that willingness to kind of look around, I think, for some of my uh, staff is, is a is a hindrance in that. I don't know if I answered that well, other than to recognize I think that second part is a, is a big question to think through. Like, how do, how do you make people more aware of things? Thank you. I did have one question. OK. Um, you're, so you're doing, uh, just a clarification from earlier, you're doing a parent-teacher orientation or you're going to bring all the parents together. You're not going to have two separate orientations. I'm going to have one. One for every language. Yes, yeah, so and now I have to come up with another topic for the first one with my multi language. <laughs> I've had this canned presentation for years, and now I've got to come up with something different. Uh -huh. uh, but I think that's a good problem to have. I'd rather talk about other things rather than talking about the same thing twice, right? So, how many parents are coming to this event, and how are you informing them? So, that will be um, uh, I typically have about 250 to 300 parents will come to the new family orientation. So that would be the one that you were referencing. Uh, later on in September, we have uh, a curriculum night. Think of it like a school open house. Um, and where I usually do take some time at the very beginning to actually do a large presentation. And there I have about five to 600 family members who come to that. Wow. And so that would represent all of the different languages? That the, were most. Most. Yes. Okay. How, are you, how do you inform them? Is it just, I guess there's... I mean, if the, if, the, if the parents don't speak English, how do they know to even come to this? So, and so that's where we, um, we um, and there's the crux of the problem, right? So with our traditional tools, how do I make sure everybody knows about this? Um, we are, um, one of our tools is really try to drive people, as much as I will send electronic communication, um, I'll say paper communication, I'll provide it in as many languages as I can, um, but the, the more that my, the cult, community culture works through our website where they can translate that into their, 
everything into their own language so then I can have all the information there for them. Do you use automated technology also? Yes. To oh, you do, okay. okay. Cool. That sounds formidable. There's our challenge, yeah. right? <laughs> um, you know, the, the thing of... Oh, can you, yeah. so that you can, can you grab the mic? Sorry. I mean, here you're going to have this big meeting that everybody with all different languages coming to. Aren't you going to have a little 15 at least minute pre session so you can teach them, people who don't speak English, how to use the technology? We, we, so, so, working with the ambassadors who are going to be working that, yes, that will be an aspect for the use of this. So, he asked about how they know about it. So, when they come, we're going to front load this as much as possible ahead of time. Um, so that they're not showing up needing to download the software, but then what we can do is we can have that, like you said, a little help session just before we get yeah. started, um, walking them through those steps. And you can use the letters too that we provide. You could, and that would be one aspect, yeah. but letters only go so download. far, right? And to some yeah. degree, there is that advantage of having that human assistance and actually seeing, seeing this is where I go, this is what I do. All right. Other questions? Well, thank you very much, Russell. Right. It was very nice of you to come today. Uh, oh, okay. one other. I'm sorry. Well, it's not really a, a, a question, but maybe maybe an a, an ask. Uh, if you had the uh, the uh, time and uh, and uh, and support by somebody or like your daughter or so. To, to make a to make a uh, a video or some instructional content that you could post on video to help others uh, have your experience or learn from your experience and go through that process of uh, of adopting uh, uh, make that uh, faster for them. Okay, that just an ask. We will. Um... As, so we're a learning organization, so the more that, that we can learn, the more that we can share that out. Like I'm, I'm committed to, to um, help us not just within my school, because I want to make sure that it stays within the school. I will only be there for a certain period of time before I probably will move on to do something different. Um, and so how does this become just part of the culture of the way that we do business? All right, well, thank you for the invitation yeah, to come out and share much. with you today.